Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Is a paralytic just a paralytic? Why did the priest in Luke walk down from Jerusalem and not up? What is the significance of being half dead or left for dead on the side of the road? Why are we told in Luke, not once, but twice, that functionaries of the temple passed by specifically on the other side of the road? Are all these coincidences and casual occurrences, or is something more at stake? In this week's episode, Richard and I explore these questions, explaining the central role of rigorous study in a disciple's lifelong quest for biblical wisdom. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. This is Father Mark Boulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to the 20th episode of the Bible as Literature podcast. Today, Father Mark and I have been talking a lot about reading the Bible as literature and what it means to read it as literature. And the question that keeps coming up when we talk is how far are we allowed to push the text? How far past the obvious meaning should we be pushing? Is it okay? And this just reminded me very much of an English teacher I had back in ninth grade. And we were reading a book and he purposely picked a kind of obscure, not so great science fiction novel for us to read. And he started talking about all kinds of symbolism in the book. And he stopped at one point. He says, you probably think I'm crazy for pushing it this far and looking at symbolism and stuff. We're all 18 and we're nodding our heads. And he said, but we have a duty to do this because this is how you really understand literature. This is how you get meaning out of literature by pushing it and seeing what kind of meaning you can squeeze out of it. For me, when I read the Bible, it's something that's very important. And having done linguistics, looking at the morphemes and the verb tenses, I find meaning in these things. It's not even enough to know Hebrew. You need to know a technical level of Hebrew. Now, does every single person need to know this in order to understand the Bible? No. But I think that insofar as any individual is capable, he or she needs to push the text as far as they can. The great thing is, is once you realize you've pushed it as far as you can, but you realize possibly it could go farther, then you're encouraged to go and learn more. I agree that it's possible to be fed by the Bible if you don't read, for example, biblical Hebrew. However, there are limits to what you can receive from the text if you are not working with others who have those skills or capabilities, whether that comes in the form of a concordance, a dictionary, a linguistic study of the text, those kinds of things. I mean, you can rely on other authors who have done the work, but the best way to approach any primary material is to develop the skills and the capabilities in your own personal tool set to try to analyze the data, because ultimately, so long as you're depending on someone else's dictionary or someone else's knowledge of the Hebrew or someone else's concordance, you're not doing the science of reading truly on your own because there's only so many conclusions you can draw without the technical apparatus. So I agree with what you're saying, but I want to add that clarification as an encouragement to our listeners that really ultimately what we're striving for in this podcast is to encourage and to motivate our listeners to pick up the text and to become amateur biblical scientists. I mean, do the work yourself so that when someone asks you, what do you gain from reading the Bible? You can speak about it with authority based on your own, genuinely, your own analysis and your own opinion. So that, I just, that's just my plug for this idea that everyone can do scholarship and everyone can speak with credibility about the Bible if they're willing to put the time in. Right. I mean, when you're a kid and you want to know more about science, you know, maybe your parents will buy you a microscope and you get a kid's microscope scope from the toy store and you're able to understand certain things, it might spark your curiosity and you say, oh, there's something else going on, but I can't see with my microscope. Mom, can I get a better microscope? Exactly. And then you go and you get a better microscope and eventually you get to a certain point. Even scientists get to a point where the tools they have are limited and so they go ahead and have to invent new tools so that they can get farther down and understand the natural world better. If there's a pit and you want to know about it, then you take a stick and you start probing. How deep is this thing? 
you might find that, hey, this is deeper than I thought. My stick isn't long enough. I guess I know it's at least this deep. Or you can say, maybe I should get a longer stick. Or why is it that I can only push down this far in this area? Is it because this is the limit of the ground depth? Is that the basic reason? Or is there something else going on? And I think that question, is there something else going on? Any good scientist knows that it's irresponsible not to probe that question. You can never assume that, for example, as we didn't assume in last week's podcast, you can never assume that it's obvious that the man lying there is a paralytic in the generic sense of the term. If you make that assumption, you might not miss the basic plot, but you will potentially miss out on the pearl of the gospel which is always there for the taking if you're willing to make the effort. Thanks for bringing up last week's episode because, for example, John says he was lying there 38 years. He meant a long time. He'd been there a long time, but the author could have written he was there a long time. Why did he say 38 years? Maybe this pit is much shallower than we think, but we have to go and take our stick and start poking around. Oh, 38 years, there is another thing that takes place for 38 years. That's being 38 years in the wilderness. Is that significant? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. On the surface, I can't say. It could be a coincidence. But I have to ask the question, is this a coincidence or is it not a coincidence? Very often, I think there's an assumption that there's continuity with the modern discipline of writing and the ancient discipline of writing. We assume that writing is writing is writing and in a modern setting we write for very different reasons and in very different ways than the writing that took place in the ancient world today when we write we're very utilitarian we focus on brevity and clarity and we want to get at a literal meaning in order to convey a business concept or in order to convey an exciting plot twist to entertain people we aren't in the business of technical writing in the ancient sense when you look at the ancient world where writing was the only scene in town. There was no other medium with which to communicate aside from the human voice. What you had in the ancient world from the very beginning was the top of the top of the creme de la creme of those who were capable of doing anything, focusing on writing and writing was the new technology and it was extremely important for the institutions of the ancient world. So the fact that there were some people who were able to write scripture is no joke. And they were not writing the way that we write emails to each other when we're sitting at a word processor. 38 might just be 38 for a modern American. A person's name might just be a name for a modern American. But it wasn't so in the ancient world. Things had a value. Well, and there was a cost for writing them. The, the cost, I think, is very important because we have to understand how expensive and how resource intensive it was to write, the education it would take to teach somebody to write, as opposed to do something that fed the family because other things that people did more directly fed the family than writing. So it was expensive not just because of the materials but also because of the education and the opportunity cost of what they could be doing. So because it was so expensive, they didn't have the opportunity to waste. They didn't have scratch paper. Occasionally they could use a piece of clay or something like that to scratch something out. But oftentimes we see notes written on pieces of clay that they were trying to hand off from one person to another. Every object for writing was dear. And it was a highly specialized practice. These were people who had to have a very special education and would focus all their energy in this activity. And they had very limited resources and space within which to work. Exactly. And that's why I always go in with the assumption that someone put a heck of a lot of thought into this or that word. One of the examples I thought of that we can see how important it is to look at the technical matters of the assumptions behind words that are chosen. You and I were talking about the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke. You know, in that story, we have a priest and he's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, it's significant that he's going down. Why is he going down? Well, in the ancient conception, at least the biblical conception, Jerusalem is up and everything else is down because it's the biggest mountain, Mount Zion and all that kind of thing. It's the high point there. Even today in modern Hebrew, when you immigrate to Israel, you make Aliyah, which comes from the root Al, which is to go up, similar to in Arabic Ali, Ala, over or high. Now, the author said he was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Okay, well, why do you say this? Because isn't the point of the story just that he wasn't merciful to this person? He could be going anywhere. He could be going on vacation from, you know, Miami to the Keys. Why does it matter where he was was going from where he was going to. So the author could have just left it out. A priest was walking down the road, but he didn't. He said he was coming down to Jericho. So is it significant? Maybe, maybe not. Well, let's probe it and see what happens. Well, if he's a priest, 
and he's leaving Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the location of the temple. If the priest was coming from the temple, that means he was going to have to be ritually clean in order to do whatever he was going to do in the temple. Otherwise, he would be unclean and not be able to go there. So is it significant that he came down from Jerusalem? I can't prove it to you, but it says something about a priest that he just was finished with his priestly duties when he ran into this person. So this is the important part. If a priest is coming down from Jerusalem, it's because he was not just traveling to go on vacation. He was leaving his priestly duties and had fulfilled the sacrificial demands of Torah before he ran across a sick, perhaps dying, perhaps dead person. To put it in the terms that are often used by the self-righteous, he went to the liturgy and he was filled with the Spirit. So he's filled with the Spirit. So we know he's coming from his Spirit-filled experience in the temple. Now what? What are the implications? Which Spirit is he filled with? These are the kinds of questions you can begin to ask when you notice this point. That exactly. Raise. It raises a whole new set of questions about what it means to be a priest who has just fulfilled his ritual obligations. What about the non-priest who has just fulfilled his ritual obligations, like going to liturgy, like going to church, and being filled with the Spirit? And so, as a result, because you notice this small detail, which the author may or may not have intended, but like my English teacher said, we have a duty to probe. And by probing it, we understand something new about the parable that Jesus said. Now, we could say, well, Jesus didn't intend for us to understand that. I don't know if Jesus intended it. All he intended to tell was a story. And he happened to include certain details, and the gospel writer happened to depict Jesus telling a story. And if we're serious about our assumption that this is the word of the living God, then we have to take every character, every iota, as Matthew says, every marking on the page we have to take seriously. Not literally in the sense that the fundamentalists take it literally, but literally in the sense that it's what's written and you have to deal with it. A scientist cannot look at the data and decide which data is important and which data is not important until he takes the totality into consideration and can explain each of the individual datum in context of the whole. It's extremely important. The Bible has made me a very irritating person. We had a doctor one time and there was an issue with somebody in my family and the doctor said, I think it's X. And I said, well, how do you know it's not Y? How do you know it's not Z? Well, I think it's X. Really? Because I'd like to hear why it's not Y. Did you check? Did you look? And so we could say, all right, well, because this is depicting Jesus telling a parable, maybe there's a little bit of difference. But if we look at this story in Luke, and we say in literary terms with the framing narrative, the discussion that Jesus is having with the lawyer when he's telling the story, the lawyer says, who is my neighbor? And then at the end of the story, Jesus says, who was neighbor to that man? Now, it's pretty much the same question, right? But it's kind of different. Is it significant? Is Luke actually trying to make a point? Then I have to ask the question, is this different for a reason? Let's say it is. I don't know if it is, but I'm going to make the assumption just to see. I'm going to assume that there is a difference on purpose. Right. Okay? And so the difference is who is my neighbor? That's putting me as the center. It's also creating the categories of neighbor, not neighbor. You impose a category of neighbor on some people and not on other people. But Jesus says, who was neighbor to that man? The question is, are you in the category of neighbor or not? It's not you at the center making judgments about other people. Now it's saying, what do your actions say about who you are? Okay, so maybe Jesus didn't mean to change the question. But if we make the assumption that he did, again, we find something much deeper that Jesus wasn't answering the lawyer's question. He was answering his own question in order to put it back in the face of the lawyer and to judge the lawyer even on the basis of the question he was asking. And it's written, it's agrafi, which means that it's not casual. In other words, I think people hear that and they think of it as though it's a casual conversation, as though it's in the Hollywood genre of realism and film. No, it's not a casual conversation. Someone took time to write those words down for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. Another example in the very same pericope mentions that the man was beaten and left for dead on the side of the road. You cannot hear it as though, oh, that just means he got really beat up, which is how 99% of the people hear it in English. You have to hear it as a Jew from Palestine in the first century who knows that death is not acceptable according to the Torah. You can't touch it, it's unclean. He's coming down filled with the Spirit from Jerusalem. 
ritually pure, filled with the Spirit, is obviously Paul's letter to the Corinthians. I'm playing on that tension. But he's walking down from Jerusalem, ritually purified. But to what end? In his mind, we know it's a selfish end because he sees his neighbor, whom Jesus is saying he should decide to be a neighbor toward. Instead, he looks at that person who's left for dead as unclean and goes around him and avoids him. So he remains ritually pure, but pure according to whose instruction, whose Torah. You can never see this tension if you don't at least ask the question, is up just because it's up? And is dead just because it's dead or is something else going on here? That's the idea. Because there's a technical sense of being dead. The priest was being safe. If he might be dead, then to be on the safe side, he'll try not to touch him. This is the scandalon of the text because ultimately ritual purity is a kind of training that should put you in the frame of mind to risk everything as the priests are instructed to do in Leviticus, to risk everything for the sake of the neighbor. Note in Leviticus, this famous passage that I always talk about when we address the healing of the lepers in the New Testament, the priest has to check a leper seven times. And there are specific rules for how to inspect his skin and so forth. Who wants to touch a leper seven times? So is the ritual instruction about the fear of uncleanness? Or is it about dealing with your fears so that you can be set free to love? That's the question I think that Luke is addressing. Right. Never mind the scandal of the religious leader who's supposed to be mm -hmm. embodying these values, just, you know, throwing the guy away. Right. So everyone has a duty to whatever extent they're able to probe the text as much as they can. And I think there's something very practical that every listener of this can do. Read your Bible carefully. And if something jumps out at you as peculiar, ask yourself, why might this be the case? You can't do it wrong. Sometimes people are afraid of questioning the text because they're afraid they're going to offend God or something like this. God is not offended by people probing the text. I mean, there's a great story in the Talmud that the Lord reads scripture every day. Why is this? Obviously, it's not because the Lord needs to learn something from scripture. The idea is that the act of studying scripture carefully is itself a holy action in Judaism. It's divine. It's divine. And we, and we have this. That's why Paul's the divine apostle, because he studied Torah and explained it to the Gentiles very clearly. Exactly. So I think that anyone here can ask the question, don't make the assumption that, oh, it was just written like this and I don't know enough. Because when you say you don't know enough, you're letting yourself off the hook. If you don't have a yardstick, use a straw. If you don't have a straw, use your finger. If you don't have a finger, use your toe. But do something to probe that just a little bit and you will learn something. And when you learn it yourself, it's going to sink in better and you'll become more knowledgeable about the word of God. And there's no excuse, oh man. Or as the Psalter says, you cannot make excuses and excuses in sins. If you don't know scripture, you aren't even allowed to say, I don't know it. This is already problematic. If you don't know it, why aren't you carrying a copy with you and reading it? This is the question. Because if you stay in this rut where I don't know or who am I to say all this nonsense, you're never going to get anywhere in life. And life is short. And even if you dedicated 100% of your life to the study of scripture, it would not be enough. I know it's very popular in our Socratically infected culture to imagine that wisdom is talking to everybody and getting a wide array of opinions. But that's a Hellenistic value. It's not a biblical value. In scripture, you have one father and you have to listen to his instruction if you want to live. And you don't have enough time even to read his instruction, let alone digest it. It takes a lifetime. So why are you wasting time? It's so urgent that you have to actually, as you're saying, just delve in and work at it. It's not about right or wrong. It's not about whether you're mistaken. It's about whether you make the effort and how you grow from that right. effort. And if anybody is reading a text and they stumble on something, please leave a comment. We'll respond to it. If you notice something that's cool, please let us know. It's always exciting for us to read from listeners what you've been finding in the text. I mean, when you were reading the text carefully, my daughter, when she was seven, they were reading in Sunday school about the Last Supper. And she's asking questions about what does it mean they're eating Jesus's flesh and his blood? This makes no sense. Correct. It makes no sense. How can they eat his body and blood while he's sitting there? While he's sitting there and not dead. Right. So out of the mouth of babes. Exactly. We have to become like children and just ask the obvious questions. It's a very good conversation. To have to be with us. Thank you very much. You've just 
heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening.